Uh, how did, did I pronounce it wrong? Bobinski. And Kendra Benny. Okay. And uh, I think I've got everybody covered here. If I didn't, then please forgive me. But uh, we would be very, very happy uh, to have a panel discussion now. And uh, I'm, I'm transferring the baton to Regina Gill. Thank you so much. This is going to be open to you. If you have questions, we're going to ask you to feel free to ask those questions of Dr. McDonald Stewart, of Shuli Asha, of Dr. Raphael Medoff. Is it safe to say that you all learned something tonight that you didn't know before? Just as an aside, um, we do have those DVDs. I know that I've bought some that I'm going to give to people who are not able to come tonight. If you want them, they'll be up there on your way out. I'm going to start with you, Shuli. Um, you started to say what drew you to make this documentary about um, James G. McDonald. Well, I can you hear me? No? Yes. no. Is it on? It's not on. Okay, we need the microphones on. Okay. Well. Oh, now they're yeah, on yeah. now. Yeah. Thank you. Well, what drew me to uh, make this documentary started with a, a postcard that I got for a lecture about James McDonald called Eyewitness to History. And I looked at the postcard and I saw McDonald, his daughter Barbara, when she was 21 years old, and Golda Meir. And I was looking at it and I was saying to myself, how come I've never heard about this man who rescued and saved Jewish refugees before the Holocaust and during the Holocaust, and then became the first US ambassador to Israel? So the first thing that went into my mind was that the, the fact that the lecture was about the missing pages of McDonald's diaries was a, a very important turning point. They were found in 2003, as you saw in the film. And when I went to the archivist, Stephen Mize, who's in the film, and asked him if uh, McDonald's daughters are still alive, and he said yes. And I said, well, then I have to supplement those diaries and make a documentary for the world to know about what a courageous and amazing man of conscience that McDonald was. So that's really what led me to make this documentary and drew me to, and I felt, as an Israeli, I kind of felt like McDonald felt about letting the world know about what Hitler was uh, uh, threatening the Jews. And I felt it was like a calling for me to make and tell this story. Somebody had to, and I thought I would be the person to do it. Thank you. I want to call you Bobby because she keeps Please calling you. Do. Bobby, do. I feel honored. Your father was a devout Christian. To what extent do you think his work for Jewish refugees was a reflection of his perspective as a Christian? And how did he come to grips with the reality that many Christians did not share his interest in the plight of the Jews? I think the, the credo does answer the question, really, of um, why he cared about the refugees and, and Jewish refugees in, in particular. Uh, as to his fellow Christians, uh, he did find it disappointing. And he accepted it as a, a fact. Uh, Anti-Semitism was rife in the 1930s. Uh, people were involved with the Depression and other interests. And I, one of the best illustrations was his appeal uh, to 100 philanthropists 
um, men who had given money before for refugee causes, um, and he wrote and asked them for money to support uh, refugee children, uh, Christian refugee children, to come into the U.S. Uh, there was only one person who responded uh, with money, and that was uh, the wife of uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise. Thank you. Dr. Meadow, Raphael Meadow. This documentary chronicles one of the most powerful but least known stories of the Holocaust. Without asking you why it's only coming to light, why it didn't come to light uh, in the 60s, but uh, does it shine a light on what happened before and during the Holocaust? You know, a lot of us recently watched the seven-part Ken Burns series on the Roosevelt's. Yes. Good timing. And there, and there you kind of, you get a sense of sort of the old view, the old school view of Roosevelt. He was a, a Roosevelt, Fra Franklin Roosevelt, a president who could do no wrong, it seems. And the whole issue of the, the plight of the Jewish refugees in the Holocaust was kind of breezed over. In, the, in those seven, uh, those seven episodes, this film fills in the other side of the story. In this film, we hear about someone who should have been in that Ken Burns series, but but was not. James McDonald and the the minority of Americans who did speak out, who tried to persuade President Roosevelt to do something about the Jewish refugees. There's a there's an important story um, that has not been told by some mainstream filmmakers, but Thankfully, it is now reaching uh, public, the public's uh, awareness thanks to films like Shuli Eschel's. Thank you. Karen. I have a question concerning the role of the we're diary. Going, we're going to repeat your question. Here, here, you got a mic. Okay, here it comes. I have a question concerning the role of the diarist and what that means to edit the diaries and to have three editors, but also you grew up with this man, although he must have been traveling. I don't know if he traveled a lot. I'm curious, how much did you know and might have been frustrated that other people didn't, or how much was a surprise to you as you went through this material? I guess the surprising thing to me, uh, when I typed it initially to put it on disk from uh, the uh, typed pages, was how often he wasn't home. Because to me, uh, he was totally, or, and my sister, totally part of our life. Uh, I remember him reading, to, reading stories to me before I went to bed. We walked to school together, uh, listened to music together. Uh, he was totally centered on his children and his family. And I, as I, Type the diaries. Uh, he was never home. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, it was the second part to your question. But well, what surprised you? What you learned about? Were, were you surprised about when you learned about his work, his meetings with Hitler, and all of, all of that? Yes, because during much of the time, um, I was obviously younger and. and and not involved in politics, and uh, so it, it was. It was so. It was wonderful because it was like visiting with my father during the time that I transcribed the diary. Mm -hmm. I speak for everyone. Here comes the mic. Just a little moment. There you go. I think I speak for everyone. Just hold it up close. I think I speak for everyone that we've enjoyed the, the movie and how important the movie was. It has a personal relationship to me as well. I live in that town that's just north of Tel Aviv called Netanya, and that is my rabbi. And I knew the other woman speaking, and I go to that shul. So I know it very well, and I know her whole McDonald very well. Uh, two quick questions. One is, when was the film made? And secondly, what are your plans for distribution of the film? It has not been shown in the, in the shul. Best of my knowledge. This is, this is the world premiere. 
Yeah, this is the world premiere. Uh, thank you, and I was very uh, lucky to go to Israel uh, with my boyfriend that I forgot to thank, uh, Tom Garvey here, that had to watch at least four, uh, 10 rough cuts because, you know, I was very meticulous and I worked very hard at it. As I said, I spent three and a half years working on this film. Uh, but the plans for distribution, I really would like to get it on PBS nationally. So far, we do have one uh, request from Indiana University, uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, where McDonald uh, was teaching and studied and, and graduated and also taught. And they looked at the documentary and they really were very moved by it. And they want to show it on uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day next year on April 16th, 2015. But I've been so busy trying to promote the, the premiere today and tomorrow we have a screening at Great Neck, New York. And then when I go back to Chicago, we are going to be showing the film at the Illinois Holocaust Museum, which is a Chicago premiere, and then at Temple Shalom, also in Chicago. After that, I will put all my time and effort to get this to the public. Also, Barbara might want to add that we are thinking of a study guide for students, for high school students, because we think it's a very important film to get to schools and uh, we will be raising a little bit of funds to do that, more funds, and, um, and, and we hope to get it to all the public schools and high schools. Yes. Over there, want to stand up, please? A wonderful film, and um, I think I can also help you with, with its future. But the reason for the question, Barbara, could you tell us anything about life that you or your family remember in Israel with your father in the years 1948 until 51 when he left? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I remember lots of things. <laughs> and it, it was exciting and uh, a totally new experience as a uh, college graduate. I did not learn anything about running a household. Uh, so uh, running a household with a, a cook who spoke Russian and Hebrew, neither of which I spoke. Her, hus her husband, the gardener, spoke some German. And uh, there was also the, the uh, gal that helped do the cleaning and serving. And she, um, spoke French. So uh, somehow it, it all worked out and uh, uh, we all, all survived because it was, um, many people came to visit and, but it was, a, what I remember most I think is the, the casual uh, getting together for dinner, whether it was with Ben Gurion or Charette or Kaplan or any of the leaders. It was uh, not so much political discussion, but they often discussed uh, biblical references. Uh, did Jesus speak Aramaic or what? They were more interested in, in that kind of topic than rather than the politics of things. And uh, people were, the Charettes actually lived next door. And uh, when I didn't have enough napkins, things hadn't come from the U.S., I went over and borrowed some napkins from Mrs. Charette. But none the fortunate part was that people didn't depend upon the protocol air uh, attitude. Uh, you had a much more personal relationship with people. And, and that was wonderful. And to be able to meet even all the U.S. visitors that came, and they'd always come to the, uh, the house and uh, either have tea or there was dinner. Or, and it was exciting to meet, meet all the people that were so, at that point, dedicated heart and soul to make uh, Israel work. 
I would like to follow this up with a little question. How did that influence your life as, as a woman, you know, being the official hostess of the U.S. Embassy at the age of 21? And then how did that influence the rest of your life? I don't know, one goes back to normal, that's it. <laughs> no, but you went and studied history. Was that, oh, well, I, I'd always liked history. Uh, I had to decide whether I wanted to get history or, or go to law school. But law school for women was a little difficult, I think, at that time. But I figured if I wanted to get married, which I did, wanted children, which I just wanted, um, Teaching was probably a better profession than the law. <laughs> okay. How does one over here one wonderful yes? And she's gone? She's been waiting for this. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is not a question. It's a little little bit this is a personal question for my earlier years. In the 1930s, about 1938, I was a student in high school, and I was on the school newspaper, Thomas Jefferson High School. The newspaper was the Liberty Bell. I was on the staff, but I was, did not have the assignment to interview Mr. McDonald. And the first I heard of him was a glowing report by the girl who interviewed him, who said what a wonderful man he is, and she was just thrilled. She also didn't, I don't remember whether she mentioned that he was handsome or not. But that, but, and that was the first I heard of Mr. McDonald. And I sort of followed his career. And then when I heard that he, the, uh, this dedication would be for him, I went to my records, I went to my old Liberty Bell and I found a paper in 1939 where he addressed the graduating class of Thomas Jefferson High School. And I found the paper and I presented it to Mr. To Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. believed that people could learn, that people could improve, and it was worth trying to help them. And if it didn't succeed, not everybody's going to take to whatever you're trying to, to teach or to help. And uh, I, I don't think he was really discouraged. Well, I, I well, reading his diaries, I felt that he was discouraged sometimes. Oh, there yeah, were times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you have very. He kept very meticulous diaries, and all his conversation with everyone. And it came through to me that he was frustrated, but he was very diplomatic and very um, patient. And, but he did. He was relentless. He went and he he tried everything he could, and met again and again and again. No wonder he was not at home a lot, and then, you know, because you could, when you read his diaries, and I tried to get to give that sense in the film that he was continuously, continuously trying to alert, to warn the world, to try to do something before it was not too late. He did everything he could, but obviously we know what happened. And uh, maybe uh, Madoff, uh, Dr. Madoff would like to add something about what did your uh, experience of his patience and 
dealing with frustration? When I looked at uh, James McDonald's papers at Columbia University, I was particularly looking at the later years, the 1940s. A lot of the film had to do, of course, with the 1930s and the, the German Jewish refugee crisis. But in tracing his efforts all the way through into the 1940s, one of the things I noticed was that in the later years, he became more openly critical of the American government's response and the Allied response to the Holocaust. And I, I, my sense was that it was a kind of an accumulation of frustration that he tried so hard in the 30s and generally had not succeeded, and now he was, he was watching the horror of the mass murder of the Jews unfold um, before the eyes of the world, and still so little was being done to help them. There was a question back there, yeah? Uh, I'm a synagogue member of Park East, and I'm thrilled that you chose Park East to premiere your movie. Um, I recently saw a documentary about uh, uh, Secretary Morgenthau and his family, and I remember his frustration in dealing with President Roosevelt but I also think I saw a short clip um, of President Hoover after he retired from the presidency. Um, he went to Germany and he was also struck by Hitler's determination to annihilate uh, the Jewish population. Was there any mention of uh, contact with Hoover uh, in the diaries? Mm -hmm. There was, actually a couple of times, um, McDonald suggested Hoover, uh, when they were looking for someone uh, to work on the committee. Um, but other than that, I don't think there was any, any reference. Mm -hmm. There's a microphone right there. Two questions. First of all, how long did the meeting with Hitler last and what language did they speak? And secondly, Barbara, have you been back to Israel? <laughs> uh, first question. I believe it was, was German, but my father understood enough. He wasn't really, it may have been uh, translated. I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure what, what language uh, it was. Um, but. Um, well, I'm, I'm really not sure. I shouldn't answer the, the question. Uh, as to going back to Israel, yes, I went back uh, four years ago, and it was very exciting to see the changes. I couldn't find the hotel where we stayed. I couldn't, I couldn't find anything except Dizzy Golf Circle, and that's still there. The stay we stayed in the hotel it was the cinema. But other than that, the whole beachfront is totally changed, and all the cities that have grown up, and the great the highways, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Back yeah. there? Hello, well, Barbara. You mentioned oh, in the film, in the film, uh, the ambassador was in favor of the two states. And he also said the Arabs don't want peace. And now it's these many, many years later, and there's this huge problem of the two states. Did your father have any, any conversation that's not in all those diaries that he talked about how those two sides could get together, how it could work, and at this time, is, is there a person like your father who could bring the two sides together more? Oh. How's that? I wish I knew the answer. Um, but as far as he was concerned, uh, he also was uh, tried to work uh, for a solution for the 
Arab refugees uh, went to a conference and tried to keep bringing up the subject. And of course, if they had been able to take care of the Arab refugees as they existed in 48, uh, we wouldn't have the tremendous problem we have today. But none of the Arab states were willing to take any of the refugees or give money to help with projects for the refugees. And uh, Israel said, we have to uh, have peace before we can discuss what happens to the refugees. So that he, he really worked, tried to see what could be done, but uh, he really thought that unless you work together, unless, uh, and the Arab states and, and Israel complemented each other uh, and were willing to accept each other. Uh, it was the only way that you would have peace in the Middle East. But it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yes. yes. Well, I'm, my name is Hannah Eschel. My aunt, I'm Shuli's, aunt. Shuli's aunt. I was born in Israel, and I was in the army the, this, during these years. We never heard of him. Nobody ever mentioned McDonald. And I'm so, now I'm so surprised after seeing all that. I've seen the film before. And I think that more things should be done that this film should be shown in Israel, because it's impossible that we never knew about it. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Yeah, and my, my aunt, Anna, is an artist, by the way, and uh, the documentary I made about her is called The Four Lives of Hannah Eschel, A Portrait of an Artist, and I'm so proud of her. <laughs> Last question? Back there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Not a question, but to what was just said. We don't read about McDonald in American history books either. <laughs> yeah, I think McDonald fell in between the cracks, and that's why I'm so grateful that this woman, uh, Mrs. Ketchum, found the missing pages, and the, the U.S. Holocaust Museum tracked. Uh, Barbara and Janet, Janet Barrett and Barbara McDonald, and then Barbara had most of the other pages and that they published it, but I would like Barbara McDonald to say a few words about the third diaries of McDonald that are coming out at the end of November. Uh, the diaries of the third volume uh, deals with the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry and it deals with the problem of the DPs after the war. And you saw some of the footage of that on the, in the film. And it deals with the uh, relationship between the British and the Americans, uh, which led into uh, the question of, of Truman and his support of the committee. And McDonald's convincing him that uh, he should not support the Morrison-Grady plan. But that volume, uh, I want to also, well, I should say first that um, the fourth volume is in the works, and the fourth volume is the time that, uh, that McDonald was in Israel. And that will be out in another couple of years. It's part, it's about halfway finished now. Um, but I do want to make the point that Shuley has brought up and before, and that is that uh, the diaries are wonderful to read uh, to me and really interesting to someone who doesn't know McDonald or that much about it, if you can carry through day by day and realize how these things were arranged and, and what went into it and you get involved in what was reality, and what was reality without knowing what was going to happen. So it was, there's a, a tension and excitement, but uh, there are not that many people that are going to read the diaries. Uh, the diaries, for volume one is, I don't know, 700 pages. The diary, the next one is smaller, 
but uh, it takes dedication. And Shuley's idea was that a film is so much easier for the layman to understand, or for children of a certain age to understand, it's so much more accessible, and that this is the way you could bring uh, the whole situation, McDonald's legacy, uh, to many more people by doing it through the film. And then hopefully, if they see the film and are interested, maybe some people will read the books. Right. Well, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming, and thank you to our distinguished guests.